Hey there, people of the Most High God. I hope you're doing well today. Today is February 16th. Oh, I guess about four o'clock in the morning. And there are a lot of things going on in this world today. And I hope that we are all going about doing those things we know that God has called us to do. And in case you're paying attention, because things are making less sense more and more, this is an indication that time is short and that Jesus will crack that sky really soon. I say that every broadcast, you know, and I truly believe that. And if we're students of God's word, we can attest to that fact that things are playing out according to the scriptures with pinpoint accuracy. And because we see these things playing out the way the Bible said they would, it's time to get ourselves out of the way and to focus on Jesus. It's time to ignore the air biscuits that the enemy is lobbing over our heads because those are not the things we need to be paying attention to. There are so many things happening that directly affect the people, but our attention is being misdirected to things that either mystify us or entertain us, and some are satisfied with this instead of scrubbing the Word of God so that we can see those things that God says are eternal. Are we watching for the things of God? You know, those things that he told us to watch for? Or are we allowing ourselves to be lulled to sleep, consequently allowing for the deception that is being perpetrated on the entire world? So let's not continue to pay attention to those things of the world because they're fruitless. But let's begin to pay attention to and put our trust in the finished works of Jesus at Calvary. Let's share the gospel of Christ so should he suddenly appear, we'll be found doing what he called us to do. So on today's show, we'll be talking about looking for God and his way of doing things in such a fallen world right here on Word on the Street with JP. Don't you touch that doll. I'll be right back. Hey, welcome back. Welcome to another episode of Word on the Street with JP. I'm your host, JP. And uh, man, I tell you, things are getting really, really interesting down here. And it's going to be key that we key in on the things of God and pay less and less attention to the deception that the enemy is perpetrating on the world. It's hard not to see what's going on. We've got things going on in Ukraine, the big earthquake that happened in Turkey and Syria. We're looking at um, Israel surrounded by enemies. The United States is surrounded by enemies. We got uh, aerial objects flying, you know, over our country. Got this massive train derailment that's putting toxic chemicals in the air, decimating a whole town. We've got mass shootings. We've got deranged gunmen. We've got a lot happening. And it's okay to put our attention on these things if we're filtering them through the word of God to see in what time we actually live in. The Bible says that these things would happen marking the end of the age. So we know that we are in that window of opportunity for Jesus to come back for his church. And so You know, we see a lot of bad stuff on the news, but there are a whole lot of good stuff happening in the world, too. The Bible says where sin abounds, grace abounds that much more. And so I went to an event yesterday. It was an amazing event. It was a um, cooking class for healthy food. And it was a spur of the moment event. I started not to go, but I got seriously urged to attend by the Holy Spirit and everything fell into place for me to be able to go. I had help from my mom. 
I had an opening in my schedule, so I knew that this would be the only opportunity for me to attend. So I went, and there were two of them yesterday, but I went to the first one in the morning, 11 to 1, and it was a healthy cooking seminar and lunch, and it was it was some good food, man. And so what I experienced there woke me up to the things that God was trying to remind me of to continue to do. And I have to admit, I was falling short in some areas, especially in this area. And I am so happy that I was able to get the message that God was trying to convey to me. It was a message of continued service to people, not only people that or within our realm of influence, but the less fortunate and the the homeless, the indigent, those who feel hopeless and counted out. And man, just opportunity to spread some love to these people, which I used to be, man. I tell you, I was homeless in Atlanta for, for a couple of years. And I remember the heartache, the heartbreak, the embarrassment. I remember those things. And it just all came flooding back to me. And so I want to give a shout out to the Hilltop Senior Center for making that venue available. Shout out to Miss Betty there at the center. And of course, Bishop, he doesn't like when I shout him out, but I'm going to shout him out anyway. So, you know, thank you to Carolyn Nickerson with Services of Hope Amarillo, Reverend Frasher with Communities Unlimited, the chef that came out, I didn't catch her name, and shared her gifts her culinary gifts from the High Plains Food Bank, and of course, all the amazing Hilltop volunteers that go unnoticed every single day because Hilltop gives, I know they feed 70, 80 families a day out of that center. Well, they don't have to do that, you know. They've got a captive audience in the senior center, but they put boots on the ground and they um, even feed my mom four times a week, you know, giving me relief not to have to cook during those times. And so those volunteers get there early and they prep that food and they package that food. They put that food in, in transportation mode and they get it out to to the seniors that, that are needed. And so big shout out to Hilltop and the amazing volunteers that serve there without recognition from the public every day. So this event went from demonstration of culinary health, you know, to outreach because what was served there was much more than just physical food. So thanks again, Hilltop, for all that you do. In case you're just tuning in, you're watching Word on the Street with JP. I'm your host, JP. And so now let's get in to the meat of the show. First, let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for this time of fellowship. We thank you for the opportunity to be able to get into your word, your will in relative safety. We thank you that you provide for us and you protect us and you, by your spirit, lead us and guide us in all truth and understanding. We pray that by this study, we will be able to see what you would have us to do and how we can continue to expand the kingdom of God by putting your word in action. We thank you, Lord God, for your son, Jesus, the only one qualified to make the perfect sacrifice so that we might be saved. We thank you, Lord God, for your love for us. And we thank you that you would keep us as we eat this spiritual food that it would go forth and empower us to help expand the kingdom of God and one another on this earth. And it's in his holy name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. All right. So let's get into the study. So I don't know about you, but God has been changing me in ways that I wouldn't even entertain if I didn't have a relationship with Jesus. Just changing me, especially Lately, man, I'm just so emotional about the things of God lately. I'm emotional when I see people suffering. I, you know, in times past, I said I cared, but <laughs> I was like, well, whatever, you know, you'd be all right, you know, but no, it's not the case anymore. And I'm finding 
that is happening more and more. And when I see calamity, I'm prompted to pray. And recently, the Lord's been waking me up early in the morning to spend time in prayer with him. And saying that, this episode is fitly entitled, We Do More Before 9 a.m. Than Most People Do All Day. And this is playing out in my reality because I know that the word of God tells us in James, the fifth chapter, the 16th verse, that the prayers of the righteous availeth much. And that means that the prayers of those who have put their trust and faith in God are considered to be righteous. And when we pray, our prayers are immense in their workings and powerful. And if you have the gift of tongues, your spirit is in direct communication with the Holy Spirit, and you are praying about things that you are not even privy to in the physical realm. We have the power through the Holy Spirit to affect circumstances all around the world. And I said all that to say, we do accomplish more before 9 a.m. than most people do all day by prayer. So I'm a prior Air Force guy, and our motto is aim high, you know, so you can imagine how I argued with the Holy Spirit when he urged me to use an army saying, <laughs> but obedience is greater than sacrifice, and believe me, quoting the army was a sacrifice, I'm just saying, <laughs> that's just a little jab to my army buddies and listeners, I love y'all, man, y'all are amazing. But we all know that the only way to go is high, aim high, Air Force. Anyway, okay, so <laughs> I remember how we all used to show up at the same nightclub back in the day during wartime. Army on one side of the place, Air Force on another side, Marines somewhere in the building, Navy acting like Navy guys do. And somehow there would always be a skirmish or two. But when we got downrange in the thick of the, that was great to say what we used to say, in the thick of the fight, we were all Americans and had each other's back. It's interesting how circumstance changes the nature of relationships now, isn't it? We all vow to be warriors for life in defending what we believe in. And this should be the case in the church as well. But to believe in something, we must first realize what it is and what it is in which we believe. And then we've got to believe it and what it's capable of accomplishing. In the case of being a military person, we believe in our supremacy, our military might. And in the case of the church, we must believe in the finished works of Jesus at Calvary, which it is mightier than any position held on earth. Those works that made us heirs with Christ, armed with not only the word of God, which is mighty in his working, but the guidance of his Holy Spirit, along with his unmerited favor and mercy. What better position can we be in? We launch out into every battle knowing that the God of all creation is on our side, and that's the most powerful position. We are army strong. We are members of the army of God the God who can't lose. He has made us delegates to the kingdom of heaven. The definition of a delegate. And so let me define delegate. A delegate is a person authorized to represent others, in particular, an elected representative sent to a conference. And so I want to key in on, on the word authorized. God has given us authority. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, before Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, God gave them authority over the whole of creation. And when the enemy came in and deceived Eve, then that authority was stripped and given to the enemy. When Christ died on the cross, that authority was restored and our place in God restored as well through and by the blood of Jesus and his finished works at Calvary. And so that 
made us the elect. So this says in particular, an elected representative. We are the elect. We also hold another position, and that position is that of ambassador to the kingdom of heaven. This means that we are an accredited diplomat sent <laughs> by a country, heaven, as its official representative. And so we are accredited. Have you ever been to college and the college wasn't accredited? So that means that you wasn't going to get a job, you know, <laughs> but accredited colleges hold accredited colleges and universities hold weight in the marketplace. And so because of these things, we are obligated to exercise the duties and objectives of our homeland and be obedient to those in authority who sent us. No matter what the edicts, laws, and policies are in the place in which we are sent, we are to act in the best interest of our homeland, and our homeland is heaven. But there are some who have adopted the ways of the place that they are sent to and begin to defy the wishes and disregard the objectives for which they are sent. And that is predominant in some who claim to be a part of the church or the body of Christ. And I remember when I was in boot camp, there were some who were there as cadets that were just going along to get along. They would just go with the flow. But it was obvious that this was the case because they never really took the time to fully prepare, which was the whole reason that we were there. They were never ready for drill. They were never ready for inspections, never willing to commit to the team. But only when it served their interest, never willing to help their fellow airmen in things that they were strong in, but others fell short in. They were always hard to spot at first, but they were usually two litmus tests that exposed them. The first was the classwork. The classroom work was just as hard as the physical work, and they never got into the hows and whys of it all and weren't willing to learn. Then the next was the firing range. Whenever it came time to be proficient with the weapons, they would either drop out or cry, conscientious objector, I don't believe in, in killing. The enemy believes in killing. In case you don't know what that term refers to, it's a person for reasons of conscience objects to complying with a particular requirement, especially serving in armed forces. And so these, there was a movie out, I forget what it was, it was about this um, army corpsman. He was a medic, field medic, and he was a conscientious objector. He didn't wanna carry a weapon and he proved to be really successful, but that's not the case in most cases. Someone who doesn't wanna do the whole thing is a hindrance to the whole thing. and so. We have to realize that we're representatives of the army of the most high God. And because we hold these designations, God has given us mandates that we must adhere to in order to be successful on the field of battle. And baby pop, this life, this world is battle. Second Timothy fortifies this position beginning in verse one, where it says, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace of that is in Christ Jesus. Verse two, it says, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Verse three, thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Verse four, no man that warth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Verse five, and if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. So in this text, verses one through five, it tells us how to be strong. And that is, and that is by abiding in the grace that Christ of Christ Jesus, our savior. In verse two, it tells us to believe those things that, that have been proven in God by, by being teachable, malleable, and because this will enhance our endurance and our strength. 
we'll be able to endure the battles. And that's what makes us good soldiers of Christ, is to be able to endure. And it goes on in verse 4 and tells us to give our attention to the battles at hand and not to get involved and distracted by the things of this world, which some do. And finally, in verse 5, it says that if we are successful in these things, we earn a crown for our faithfulness as long as those things we've mastered are obtained in a lawful way, a lawful manner as prescribed by the one who sent us. Abiding in the things of God makes us aware of the deception that the world would subject some to, even some who claim allegiance to Jesus. So don't be that conscientious objector who gets in and doesn't do the work, putting many at risk because they're not either focused or sincere or both. And so there's no shortage of distractions down here today. And those distractions lead to deception and the church is subject to it if we don't keep our eyes on Christ. Like I was watching um, The Chosen a couple nights ago and Jesus finally got out there and was walking on the water and Peter asked, if, if it be you, Lord, I bid you to, to, um, to um, allow me to come to you. And he started walking out there and he began to look at the waves and the wind and he began to sink. He said, I'm sinking, Jesus, you know, and Jesus says, keep your eyes on me, keep your eyes on me. And so that's what we need to do. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus. And we believe things that the news has to say instead of leaning on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And why do we continue to believe these things, the things that we see when the word of God tells us to have faith, you know, it says, and believe and not to trust in our senses, but to lean on his spirit for the truth, because let's face it, without the word of God, we can't even know what the truth really is. He says, we walk by faith and not by sight. And it's time to employ that valuable resource if we're going to truly realize victory. There are consequences to insincerity in this walk and deceit and being subject to deceit, being deceived, you know. And in knowing this, we need to put off those things that aren't pleasing to God. We need to stop operating the way the world does and fix our hearts on the things of God in Christ Jesus, and we just do. And we need to lay aside those fruitless things that affix our eternity to destruction. The word of God gives us good example of what will become of us if we remain in a fallen state and unrepentant. God gives us all the resources that we need to be successful. And to say that, let's go to 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, the first through the 13th verse. It's not going to be long. I'm going to wind it on up after this. It says in verse one, moreover, brethren, I would not have you be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Verse two, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Verse three, and did all eat the same spiritual food. So we say in verse one through three, we're all subject to God's grace and mercies. We, our forefathers were all treated the same. Verse four says, and did all drink the same spiritual drink? And they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. So they were all under grace. And that grace came by the way of Jesus. Even back then, in the Old Testament, everybody was looking for the Messiah. God manifested on the earth in the form of the Messiah, is what this is saying. Verse 5, it says, but with many of them, God was not well pleased. So he's talking in particular about the book of Exodus, when God, by his grace, led his people out of Egypt, and they begin to trip out on him. So let me start at verse five again. But with many of them, God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness because they were living under grace, yet they continued to sin under God's direct supervision, you know, 
and murmur and complain. Verse 6, it says, Now these things were our example to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. They were so blatant and bold and steeped in their sin and idolatry that they actually built a calf, a golden calf to worship while they're under God's protection in the wilderness. Just straight tripping. Doesn't that sound like what we are going through today? Okay. And so it says, verse six, now these things were our examples to the intent. We should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Verse seven, neither be idolaters as were some of them, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. That sounds like us, man. Monday through Friday, we are working for the man, trying to make that mortgage payment. No faith in sight. And boy, Come Wednesday, that's ladies' night. Come Friday, it's payday, and we are going to hit the club and go watch the car. And, you know, that's just what we do. So the people sat down to eat and drank and rose up to play. Verse 8, neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and 20,000. Verse 9, neither let us tip Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Verse 10, neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Verse 11, now all these things happen unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. He's saying, man, the end is near, so you need to remember how to treat God in these last days. Verse 12, wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. So he, he's asking us to humble ourselves in these times so that we might be able to partake of that which Jesus Christ died to give us. Verse 13, there hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. So he's saying, hey man, what you going through? Ain't, ain't new thing. You know, I'm just, that's very... You know, that's in African-American vernacular. There is nothing new. You, there's nothing new. There's not a new trouble on the earth. There have no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. He's saying I, he don't, he's not going to throw anything on us that we can't handle. But will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. So he's saying we can do this thing if we keep our eyes on Christ. You know that you have been chosen as a member of the final generation, this last generation, and you are privy and privileged to be able to see the fulfillment of prophecy from Genesis to Revelation, he is showing this generation, the church and the Messianic Jews, that he is God. He's showing up to be God. And as horrible as some of the things that are happening on the earth, it's not by the hand of God. God has warned us of the characteristics of man in the last days, that fallen man. But we are fallen if we have accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we have a sneak peek, a preview into the future because of the advantage of having access to God's very spirit. The Holy Spirit is there to comfort, lead us, and guide us. In all truth and understanding, we who are employing his tutelage are seeing clearly what the end is, we are living in the last days. Jesus will soon come and collect those who love him. It's imperative that we get it together lest we be left behind and be subject to all the things that come from the pit of hell onto the earth. The Bible says in the last days that men's hearts will fail them for fear of the things that are coming up on the earth. That means that folks are going to be stroking out, having heart attacks and stuff like that. It's going to be horrific. The carnage, unprecedented. And so we don't want to be left behind down here. I'm not saying this to scare you. I'm saying this to inspire you to look 
for his coming and to get involved in the blessed hope that you may have hope. He says that we shouldn't be looking at this as something that scares us, but we should be looking at this to inspire hope that we shouldn't give up prematurely. Man, I tell you, the world left in the hands of fallen man is a horrible thing. And we've seen it play out. We're seeing the fulfillment of Matthew 24 and 2 Timothy. We're seeing it play out. He says, and there'll be earthquakes in diverse places. Man, from, from Turkey to Syria, and then another one in Indonesia. Wow, I'm just like, wow, look at the birth pangs. Look at the frequency and the intensity. God's word is surely true. And God's word is Jesus. We need to be paying attention, y'all. I love y'all so much. And if, if this makes your ears stand up or the hair raise up on your arms and you're not saved and you want to be or you are saved and you know that you need to rededicate your life back to Christ, then this is the opportunity. I'm not one to preach hell and brimstone, fire and brimstone and hell and damnation, but I'm telling you, it's going to be crucial that we get in line with the mandates of Jesus. It's nothing that's heavy. He says that his burden is light. His yoke is easy. And it is. It's not rocket science. I tell you, being in a relationship with Jesus has been one of the most satisfying and adventurous things that I've ever been subject to. It is the most amazing position to sit in, in the seat of power amongst your unsaved peers is humbling. To see God work things out on your behalf every single time. He says that we are more than conquerors those who are in Christ Jesus. And it's the most amazing thing. Might not look like you won the battle, but it will always play out in your favor once you let patience have her perfect work. And I might be rambling, but I'm just so excited about the prospect of making it to the wedding feast of the Lamb. Anyway, <laughs> so if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you want to, I dare you, I don't dare you. I urge you, I beg you to say this prayer after me. It's a prayer of allegiance and repentance to the one and only true and living God in Jesus. And it says, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner in need of your forgiveness and salvation. I believe that you sent your one and only son begotten of the father to the earth to die, to pay my sin debt because he was the only one who qualified and he did it willingly as that you would please forgive me of my sins and come into my heart, live in me so that I'll be yours and you'll be my God. Amen. So I believe that if you said that simple prayer, that you are one of the newest members of the family of faith. So welcome to the family Get ready, get ready, get ready. In the word of, words of a famous preacher, get ready. It's going to be different and rewarding and amazing. My first recommendation for you would be to connect yourself with a Bible-based church, one that rightly divides the word of God. And to do that, get with those folks that have been subtly preaching the word to you, those folks that have been praying for your salvation for all these years, those folks that are just bold and just say, hey, man, you need Jesus, get with them so that you can connect yourself with the things of God, learn in the things of God, grow in the things of God, and be in service to God through service to people. Love on each other, y'all, because I tell you, time is winding up, and if you really wrap your head around what's getting ready to come up on this earth. You will be praying for the salvation of all those you know and love. Pray for your enemies. Love those who despitefully use you. 
for this is God's way and how we prove our allegiance to him. Loving each other is going to be one of the hardest things that we can do. Keeping the faith mirrors that thing. But if we keep our eyes on Jesus, allow him to wake you up at 2, 3 in the morning like he just did me. Man, it's 4.37. I've been at this for almost three hours already. He'll wake you up. It says, seek him early, you know, while he yet may be found. Get with him early when the world is quiet and your heart is just waking up out of slumber, out of rest that he gives. Man, it's the most amazing thing. But when he when he starts tugging on you and, and trying to wake you up, get up and enjoy this part of the day with him. And you'll see that your days will be full of him and guidance by his spirit. And so I'm I'm rambling now, but I'm so excited. I don't think I've been this excited in a long time seeing God just be God. Anyway, man, thank you so much for listening, watching Word on the Street with JP. Make sure that you're in line to do more before nine than most people do all day. <laughs> be subject to the spirit and um yeah, man, love on each other. Love on yourselves, because if you don't love on yourselves, you can't love each other. And that's right. Until next time. Yeah, we'll see you on the radio.